Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about what I consider to be the best practices when developing the .NET Core Web API projects. We'll see how to make those projects better and more maintainable. This is the opinion based on so many projects I developed throughout my developer career and working with many different clients. You will find a lot of great advice in this video regarding project organization, controller and actions, different feature implementations, security, etc. I will use the project we developed for our ultimate ASP.NET Core Web API book and if you want to learn more about it, feel free to check the link in the description below. So without further ado, let's start. We should always try to split our application into smaller projects. That way we are getting the best project organization and separation of concerns. The business logic related to our entities, DTOs, contracts, accessing the database, login messages or sending an email message should always be in a separate project. Of course, you can use folders as well, but the projects are much better for reusability. Every small project inside our application should contain several folders to organize the project's logic. This project uses the Onion architecture as the base architecture and if you want to learn more about this type of architecture, you can check my video on this topic. The link will be in the description below. You can see I have different projects for the repository layer and the service layer which is again split into two projects. Also the main app with the presentation part separated from it, etc. All of these enable better modularity, easier maintenance and the possibility to share the logic between different projects. Next let's move to service configuration. If you check the program class you can see pretty clean service registrations, everything is very readable and easy to follow. That's because we create an extension class with the extension methods to move the service registration logic from the program class. For example, in this method we configure the course policy. Also for example in this one we configure rate limiting for our API. Now imagine if we had all these configuration implementations in the program class. It would be a mess to say at least. This way we have everything organized cleanly and in a readable fashion. And our program class is clean as well. That said, let's talk more about controllers and actions. The controllers should always be as clean as possible. We shouldn't place any business logic inside it. So our controllers should be responsible for accepting the service instance through the constructor injection and for organizing HTTP action methods like get, post, put, delete, patch, etc. Now if we inspect the actions, you can find them clean and simple. Responsibilities of our actions should include handling HTTP requests, validating models, catching errors and returning responses. And even though you don't see all of the mentioned responsibilities in these actions, they do that. Just I extract the logic into different features like action filters or global exception handler, which again I will talk about in this video as those are considered best practices as well. Also our actions should have iAction result or action result t as the return type in most of the cases. I said in most of the cases because sometimes we want to return a specific type or a JSON result. That way we can use all the methods inside .NET Core which returns results and the status codes as well. You can see the most used methods in this information box. Now I already mentioned handling exceptions globally, so let's see that in action. As you saw, none of the actions have try catch blocks inside, but the exceptions are still handled. .NET Core gives us an opportunity to implement exception handling globally with little effort by using a middleware implementation or from .NET 8 we can use the iException handler interface for even easier implementation. Once we have our handler implemented, we can simply register it as a service in the program class. And also register the middleware part. Of course, I already have the video about global exception handling in ASP.NET Core Web API and you can find the link in the description below. Also, as you can see, I don't have any validation logic in my actions, but again the logic is there, just extracted using action filters to remove duplicated code. 
filters in .NET Core allow us to run some code before or after the specific stage in a request pipeline. Therefore, we can use them to execute validation actions that we need to repeat in our action methods. When we handle a POST or PUT request in our action methods, we need to validate our model object and perform other validations. As a result, that would cause the repetition of the validation code and we want to avoid that. Basically, we want to avoid any code repetition as much as we can. As you can see here, both the POST and the PUT actions are still clean even though both implement all the required validations. I have the video about action filters implementation as well, so feel free to watch it. The link is in the description below. To continue, let's see how using DTOs to return results and accept inputs helps us build better APIs. Even though we can use the same model class to return results or accept parameters from the client, this is not a good practice. A much better practice is to separate entities that communicate with the database from the entities that communicate with the client. Yes, the answer is use DTOs. The model class is a full representation of our database table and being like that we are using it to fetch the data from the database. But once the data is fetched, we should map the data to the DTO and return that result to the client. By doing so, if for some reason we have to change the database, we would have to change only the model class but not the DTO because the client may still want to have the same result. Of course, we shouldn't be using DTOs only for the GET requests. We should use them for other actions as well. Additionally, using of DTOs will prevent circular reference problems in our project. Now, let's talk a bit more about the routing. In the .NET Core Web API projects, we should use attribute routing instead of conventional routing. That's because attribute routing helps us match the route parameter names with the actual parameters inside the action methods. We can use the route attribute on top of the controller and on top of the action itself. You can see how descriptive this route is. From it, everyone is aware that to access any employee as a dependent entity on the company entity, we have to provide the ID of the company we want to get all employees for. Also, regarding the other actions in this controller, you can see that when we return all the employees, we use the same route. But for the single employee for company, we have to provide an additional ID parameter from that employee and then we have the full URI as API, companies, company ID, employees, ID. Again, fully descriptive route that self explains all the info the client has to provide to get this resource. The next thing I want to talk about as part of the best practices in web API development is logging. If we plan to publish our application to production, we should have a logging mechanism in place. Log messages are very helpful when figuring out how our software behaves in production. Of course, you can implement logs for development purposes as well but in production it shines the best. .NET Core supports a logging API that works with a variety of logging providers. Therefore, we may use different logging providers to implement our logging logic inside our project. Here, I use the nlog library to create a custom logger for this project. The nlog is a great library to use for implementation of our custom logging logic. It is easy to extend, supports structured logging and is very easy to configure. We can log our messages in the console window, files or even database. Next to nlog, we can use serial log because it is great library as well. It fits great with the .NET Core's built-in logging system. Now, I have to mention a few very important features to have in our APIs. Paging, searching and sorting. We don't want to return a collection of all the resources when querying our API that can cause performance issues and it's in no way optimized for public or private APIs. It can cause massive slowdowns and even application crashes in severe cases. So implementing paging, searching and sorting will allow our users to easily find and navigate through returned results, but it will also narrow down the resulting scope, which can speed up the process for sure. 
you can nicely use something similar to the builder pattern to chain all the calls for the paging, searching and sorting. For paging, you should provide all the required metadata and split your results. And also, you can extract, for example, a sorting logic into its own extension. This way, we have clean code and also stable APIs. But what about the versioning of our APIs? The requirements for our API may change over time and we want to change our API to support those requirements. But while doing so, we don't want to make our API consumers change their code. Because for some customers, the old version works just fine and for others, the new one is the go-to option. To support that, the best practice is to implement API versioning. This will preserve the old functionality and still promote a new one. I also have a video where I explain the versioning implementation in detail, so feel free to check it out. The link is again in the description below. The next thing I want to talk about is using asynchronous code and why it is very important. With async programming, we avoid performance bottlenecks and enhance the responsiveness of our application. The reason for that is that we are not sending the request to the server and blocking it while waiting for the response. Also, we should use an async code from the controller level, over the service layer, to the repository layer. One important thing to understand is that if we send a request to an endpoint and it takes the application 3 or more seconds to process that request, we probably won't be able to execute this request any faster using the async code. It is going to take the same amount of time as the sync requests. But the main advantage is that with the async code, the thread won't be blocked for 3 or more seconds. And of course, using the async code for the database fetching operations is just one example. There are a lot of other use cases where using the async code will improve the scalability of our application and prevent the thread pool blockings. Now, there is no point talking about the best practices without mentioning caching, as it allows us to boost performance in our applications. There are different caching technologies that we can use, like output caching, in-memory caching, distributed caching, and so on. Caching is helpful because reading data from memory is much faster than reading it from a disk. It can reduce the database cost as well. Basically, the primary purpose is to reduce the need for accessing the storage layers, thus improving the data retrieval process. There is also one additional feature that I see people miss implementing in their APIs a lot. It is content negotiation. By default, .NET Core Web API returns a JSON formatted result. And in most cases, that's all we need. But what if the consumer of our API wants another response format, like XML for example? For that, we need to create a server configuration to format our response in the desired way. Also, sometimes the client may request a format that is not supported by our web API. And then, the best practice is to respond with the status code 406, not acceptable. That can be configured as well. We can also create our own custom format rules. For example, the CSV formatter, if we need that format type for the response. Finally, I have to mention security, and one of the most used techniques is using JWTs. If we have a single client for our app, this type of authentication is perfect and easy to implement. Also, in combination with ASP.NET Core Identity for user management, we can create very powerful authentication and authorization systems for our APIs. Of course, implementing the refresh token will help your users with a more secure app and also will provide a better user experience for them. I have videos for both the JWT authentication and refresh token and if you want to learn both in more detail, you can watch those videos. The links will be in the description below. Now, as I said, if you have a single client app, using JVTs is a good option. But on the other hand, if you have multiple clients to authorize with your API, using one of the external token providers like Duende is a great solution. It allows us to easily configure different clients and APIs through simple configuration. And this is exactly what I do in our security book 
which is the part of the Web API Premium package, which is linked in the description below. So, I know there are at least a few more important practices to mention, like documentation or rate limiting throttling, but still, I'm pretty sure if you follow these mentioned in the video, you are on the right way to create great APIs. But please, share your thoughts in the comment section below about what you consider to be the best practices and what I didn't mention in the video. This would be super useful for other developers as well. Well, that's it. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button if you like the video. And if you want to get notifications from our channel about future videos, you can also use the bell button. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again in the next one. Until then, all the best.